Then here's every melody Just tell me what moves you Tell me what moves you Is it a fragrance? Then I'll pour my oil out Is it a life laid down? Then right here I give my vows Is it a song I sing? Then here's every melody Just tell me what moves you Tell me what moves you I just want to move your heart Get caught within your gaze Right here in your presence God is where I want to stay Oh, just to dwell in your house Waste my hours and my days on you On you want to move your heart, get caught within your gaze, right here in your presence, God, is where I want to stay, oh, just to dwell in your house, is my hours and my days on you. fragrance is it a fragrance and I'll pour my oil out is it a life laid down then right here I give my vows is it a song I sing then here's every melody just tell me what moves you Tell me what moves you. Just tell me what moves you. Just tell me what moves you. Tell me what moves you. You are good. You 
express Your love and your grace never fail me Your merciful touch always heals me You bring joy to my soul Joy to my soul Quiet of my soul in the stillness, I hear your voice call. Father, we bless this time and we just invite your presence in all of its fullness. Come, Lord Jesus. Please have a seat and let's continue to stay in the place of worship and as we have communion. And uh, we, we do this every week now and it's our opportunity to proclaim the Lord's death till it returns. Uh, and we, we, we so want it to be more than just something we do every week. Uh, we, in a sense of being kind of a new tradition or whatever, we want it actually to be our chance to encounter the Lord uh, and the, the scriptures say that whenever we partake, to not take of it lightly and to seek the Lord to get everything right. And this is our chance to come back under the blood of Jesus, to come and say yes to the Lord today. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a daily thing. There are, are days where the Lord is more Lord than, than others, right? And uh, it's a chance for us to come get off the throne and get Jesus back on the throne. So Holy Spirit, as we're preparing ourselves, we ask you, Holy Spirit, search us. When we partake of the bread and the cup, we want to be saying fully with our hearts and our souls and everything that we say yes to you afresh this morning today. So Holy Spirit, speak to us, minister to us. Is there anything that uh, needs to come before you, Lord? Uh, Lord, we, we need your forgiveness. We need your repentance. We need your uh, mercy and grace over us always. So come, Holy Spirit. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you've done for us. And by your shed blood, all our sins are forgiven. Remove, Lord, from us completely as you take it upon yourself, Jesus, and you give us your righteousness. Thank you, Lord, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we want to give you everything, Lord, the sin, the defilement, the shame, the guilt. Lord, we fall on your mercy, Lord, as we return to you, Lord, and, and say yes to you in every way. This morning as we partake, we say yes to you as Lord and Savior. We surrender to you again afresh, Lord. Have everything, Lord. Lord, we're completely yours, body, soul, and spirit. We bless you, we exalt you, we give you all the praise and glory and worship that belongs only to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's partake together. Welcome to Head to Mercy. Happy Father's Day, everybody. Welcome. So glad you're here. Uh, the ushers are going to come and pass the offering bags around. Uh, if you're a level, Lord, please, uh, please give. And um, right now, our live stream is down. We can't figure it out, but I'm recording it. We'll post it later. If you're online and you're a level, Lord, to give, we have a donate button on our website, handofmercy.org. And we're grateful for your, your giving and your support prayer-wise and financially and and friendship-wise, it's meant a lot over all these years. So thank you. A happy Father's Day. Next week is the last Sunday of, in the month, and so we've, we've been having a potluck every Sunday after church, last Sundays of the month. So that's next week. So just a reminder. Let's see um, if uh, there's a get hold of Barb or, or Tim. They run a text message thread so you can uh, let them know what you're bringing. Uh, and whatever we have, we share. If you don't bring anything, you're still welcome. It's been really just a fun chance to be together, fellowship some more after church. And I'm really blessed how uh, here at the church, even after service is done, I see people praying for each other. I see people ministering to each other. It's just a really, really amazing, amazing thing that the Lord has done. So happy Father's Day. Um, you know, over the many years of being a pastor and a, and a believer, you know, came to know the Lord in a, uh, more seriously in high school, started to pursue him. And you, you hear a lot of things. You hear a lot of uh, opposition, objection, arguments, uh, you know, as to why the faith isn't really real or why Jesus isn't real. And you hear a lot of stuff. And over the years, you know, it's, it's you, 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 you want to tackle them. You know, the, there's great resources and apologetics, things that help, you know, kind of answer these questions so you know. And challenges that you have from non-believers, from sometimes cults, or other denominations over certain things that we can easily get really hung up on. And so one of them that I've heard um, is, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. And when they asked him, he never directly said, I'm the son of God. And, you know, I've, I've heard that. And, and so, you know, I had to go research that. Out and, I, and my answer is now, yeah, he did. He absolutely said he was the son of God. And they say, well, where? Because he, he never really directly answered that. Well, let's go to Matthew 26, 63. Now, this is all leading to somewhere Father's Day related, but uh, <laughs> you know me. I'm going to go who knows where and eventually try to make it back to where I belong, right? So, but, so Jesus is on trial. Is my, is my volume okay? I'm not getting feedback. I'm not okay. So as long as it's okay. Um, but Jesus kept silent, so they're accusing him. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, which is basically saying, with God as your witness, answer this. Tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Meaning, are you the Messiah, are you the Son of God? And then Jesus said, you have said it yourself. And that's real tell me. See, he evaded the question. Well, if you say so, you know, well, that's what some people might say. And, the, I, and I say, no, we're talking about the culture of 2,000 years ago. The way he answered is... Basically, in today's terminology, yes, sir, Bob, you know, is you got it. That's the fact, Jack, you know. 
And then he comes back and says, Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then he refers to the Daniel prophecy of the Messiah, referred to as the Son of Man, saying, this is me, I'm coming on the clouds of heaven and on the, on the right hand of power. And so, you know, this thing about, about understanding culture from a, a different country, a different time, you know, when I was in India the first time, I would ask some of my Indian coworkers, you know, hey, can I go do this? Is it all right to do this? And, and this is what they would do. And so I'd ask the question again, is it okay for me to go do that? You know, or sometimes I would say, is it okay to do this? And they go, you know, it took me two and a half weeks of being in India for me to realize, oh, that means yes. Like this means yes in the U.S. But for two and a half weeks, I'm like, why isn't nobody answering me? You know, and then when they're going like this with their eyes, they're like, it means to me, go away. <laughs> You're annoying. Okay, whatever, right? You're not, and it means okay in Indian gestures. And two and a half weeks later, like, oh, I'm totally misunderstanding their answer. And finally, one of them's like, oh, yes, 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 of course. And so they were, they were kind of like, dude, are you dense? You know, right? And so when we get to a situation like this where Jesus say, it is as you say. He wasn't being evasive. He wasn't giving kind of a half answer. He was saying as clear as could be, Yes, what you're saying is true. This is so. And then so the next verse, we can tell by the way they responded. The high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered, He deserves death. So there was no misunderstanding in that, in that conversation, right? And so for them to say that, so it was a misunderstanding. He was being evasive. Okay, they're, they're, they're sending him to death. So if it's a misunderstanding, and he's not really the son of God, it's like, dude, no, no, you, you misunderstood me. Don't kill me. Don't kill me. I'm not really the son of God. He didn't. It went all the way to, to the cross. He was executed for blasphemy, which is putting yourself in the same level of God. And in this case, it wasn't blasphemy because it was true. Uh, that's, you know, that's that old thing is if people are chasing you, are you still paranoid? You know, if, well, I guess maybe you're not really paranoid because people really are trying to kill you. But it all depends on whether what you believe or what you think or saying is true. So it's not blasphemy because it was true, but to them, no one can do that. And so they sentenced him to death. But all this had been building up. So we go to John 5, verse 17. And it, Jesus says to them, after he heals somebody, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. The next verse for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So this is their two main issues with Jesus. Why do you keep breaking the Sabbath? You can pick any of those other, the, the six days to do this, but you keep doing it on the Sabbath. You must not be of God because if you were of God, you would not break the Sabbath. And it, it, you're basically seeing this is one of their priorities. They, there was a, a group that actually believed that if the entire nation could keep the Sabbath for one day, Messiah would come. If they could keep the Sabbath for an entire month, then the kingdom would come. And so every time Jesus did this, they were like, no, you're violating the, the, what God has commanded by breaking the Sabbath. And um, the, then now he's adding on, hey, I and my father are working till now. Is that you're putting yourself on the same level as God? It's like, no, that's blasphemy. And again, capital offenses, right? And time and time, Jesus would say that and, and say, hey, as I hear, I speak. I'm only saying what the Father tells me. As I hear, I judge. So this is really important. If you really want to understand a situation, start asking the Lord, Lord, what do you say? When I started doing that, it was crazy, the answers I was getting. There was one young woman who had, had heard Barb's feelings over something, and I got kind of upset because, you know, you defend your loved ones. Like, that's not right. Why is she doing that? And I asked the Lord, Lord, what do you think about this? And I heard him say, she doesn't believe anybody loves her, not even me. Whoa, that's not related to this. Oh, maybe it is related to what just happened. That's why she's reacting to Barb. And I didn't know what to do with that. 
And it wasn't until actually a couple years later that it, it got confirmed because he actually sent me a dream. And I finally sent it to her because the Lord tells me the rejection is the biggest wound in your life. And even you're being on the missionary field and doing everything you do is at the heart level, you're hoping that's enough that God would love you. And then her response back to me, Pastor Pete, when, we get, when I get home, we really, really, really need to talk. And it, it was the biggest wound. But I, I was like, wow. I was ready to be mad at her for, you know, having that run in with Barb. And the Lord's telling me something different. Uh, when I was having struggles with my senior pastor, and, and, you know, he was burned out. And there he was just kind of mailing his sermons and other stuff in at times, you know. And I'd be like, no, no, he's not prepared. Why are we just mailing it in? We have, and I'm, of course, in the business world at the time, we have 40 people here, 40 people times so many dollars per man hour. He's like, he is wasting this much of our time and effort because, again, he has nothing prepared. And then so, and then again, I made the mistake. Lord, what do you think about this? <laughs> and what does the Lord say? I love him so much. <laughs> he gives me everything he has all the time, which right now isn't very much. And I'm just stunned out of my anger. I repent. But it, those two things were the beginning of me realizing I don't see correctly, not even close. I assumed my anger would be the anger of God. I assumed my displeasure was the displeasure of God. I assumed my impatience was the impatience of God. It's like, I need to start asking you. And it's crazy when you ask about, especially people as children, the love, the grace, the desire, the hope he has for them, redemption always, patience always, compassion always, hope always, always, always. If I listen, clearly he'll tell me the great things he wants to do for them if they would let him. You know, it's stunned me and changed me so much. But this was, and here I'm seeing Jesus, as I hear I judge, and my just judgment is correct, because it's not my will, but the will of my Father. And he said it time and time again, you guys, you're, you're upset at me, you're picking bones with me. I'm telling you, I'm conveying what the Father is saying, doing, and the way he feels, right? And so in John 10, let's look at another example. So again, stuff's riling up, and he says to the Pharisees and to the Jews, I and the Father are one. And the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. So he, Jesus does it again. He's like, are you, are you looking to pick fights, Lord? <laughs> Which sometimes he was. How dare you even imply that you're anywhere even close to the Most High One and that you're anything like him, let alone that you're the same and that you're one. And so verse 31, they picked up stones. Jesus, verse 32, Jesus answered, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? And therein lies the, 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 where I'm trying to get to for this message is like, what an interesting answer. He doesn't start to argue with them. Well, based on these facts, based on these scriptures, based on this intellectual argument, this is why this is so. He said, okay, wait a minute. If you're stoning me, for which one of these things that I did from my father, partnered with my father, are you now stoning and wanting to kill me for, for claiming that I'm one with the father? He's healed the blind, he's healed the deaf, he's healed the lame, the crippled, lepers, paralyzed people, uh, people sick with fever, healed those who are about to die, he's cast out demons, raised the dead, fed thousands of people, forgiven sinners, even people deep into sin. So for which one of these things that I'm showing you, telling you, delivering to you from the Father, who I'm one with, are you upset with? And what, which one of these do you want to kill me for? And so the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's, and the, the, the Greek word is, it means nature, it means essence, it means person. So Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's nature, essence, and person. He's complete, that's why they call him the Word. He's completely the fullness of, of who God is being conveyed to us, words and actions. Okay? And the two are one. The, the, everything is merged together. And this is so important because we put a lot of emphasis maybe on one or the other words or in actions, usually words in, in this particular culture, we hunt out what people have misspoken so we can totally 
put them in this category of unreliable, mentally ill, evil, sinful, whatever, right? And the, in this case, the Jews are trying to do the same with Jesus. And in this he's saying, I and the Father are the same. What I, you hear me saying is what the Father is saying. What you see me doing is exactly what he's doing. How you see me responding is exactly how the Father is responding. So the thing when Jesus was healing, it was the Father healing. Also, when he was speaking words, it was the Father speaking them also. And they answer in verse 33, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. And again, this thing of because they could not get over the Sabbath break, they're seeming the Sabbath breaking, and his equating himself with God the Father, it's like, no, it's, we have to dismiss everything else that we're seeing because we don't think this is so. And then verse 37, let's jump there. And listen to what Jesus says. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. And I thought, that's so interesting. Believe my actions more than you believe my words then. If you're going to have to pick one of the two, believe what I've done. And the scriptures say that the Father sends rain on the righteous, unrighteous, the Son derives on the evil and good. By his kindness, he leads us to repentance. And he's also saying, if you don't believe what I'm telling you about myself and about salvation in Jesus, then will you believe that the sun rises every morning and it's me doing that for you, that I send grace rain, I have compassionate, uh, compassion and grace in every area, even to those who don't know me, because he's sending a message. He's telling us stuff through everything he does concerning life, you know, from the fact that we wake up in the morning, that our lungs keep on breathing, and such, right? And I find it so interesting. Uh, and the Jews, which were stuck in that, like when the blind man who was born blind was healed, and they say, what do you say about him? He's a prophet. And they're like, no, he breaks the Sabbath. He's a sinner. He breaks the Sabbath. And the other side would say, well, how can a sinner open the eyes of the blind? And so they come back to this guy and said, you know, tell us what happened again. He goes, I said it already. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you, do you want to be his disciples? He goes, no, no. No, we're disciples of Moses. We, this man's a sinner. We don't know about this man at all. He's a sinner. And the, the guy answers something so amazing. Sinner or not, I don't know. What I do know is I was blind, and now I'm not. He got the message of the, of the grace brought to him. And they're debating. It's like, no. What Jesus did spoke just as loud as any words he could have used. You were born blind, and God did something only God can do. And they ended up kicking him out, and he came, came to Jesus, right? right? And in the midst of this, look, he says here, so that you may know and understand what? What does he want us to know and understand? Jesus is in the Father. The Father is in Jesus. They're one. And this is what's so amazing for you and I is because he says, if you love me and keep my commandments, my Father and I will come and make our dwelling in you. And his desire that, that uh, the, his prayer in John 17, because Lord, make them one like you and I are one. This thing of, Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father wanting to come live in us, all three of them, for the purposes of changing us and becoming one with us so we are transformed more and more into the likeness of Jesus, right? And so let's kind of follow this a little bit more, one more story, and then I, I will try to get to the point of what I was, I'm doing all this for. Uh, John 14, verse 7. So this is after the Lord's Supper. Peter is now, oh no, sorry, Judas is taken off to go betray Jesus, and now they're still uh, being instructed by the Lord. And it says in verse 7 of John 14, If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And we see the disciples having the same struggle. 
that even after three years of being with them and him, seeing him confront the Pharisees, they still didn't get it. Philip, you have seen the Father. I'm the exact representation of everything he is, his persons, his essence, his character, his divinity. And if you see me, you've seen the Father because we're the same. And, and so uh, and it's one of those things we often say, I wish I were a disciple in those days. No, you don't, because until the Holy Spirit came, they were as dense as doorknobs, right? <laughs> and uh, it's like, thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. And, right? And so there's no separation between, okay, you know, Lord, you know, when, when you go home and you see the Father, tell him, he's like, no, no, you're telling me, you're telling the Father. I'm doing this. He's like, well, is that okay? If I'm doing it, it pleases the Father because I only do what he tells me to do. So all the love, all the compassion, all the pursuit of us that Jesus has done for us, it's, it, it's an agreement, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all the way through, right? Uh, verse 10, and he's saying to Philip, Do you not believe that I am the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father inviting me does his work. And this is very, very much the point that I really want to grab. Do we realize this? And do we realize what's actually happening inside us? The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are in you, and you are in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's work is to grow us into greater oneness, that we are turned and changed into the likeness, the essence, the person of Jesus that we're like Jesus. And Jesus is already the essence, likeness, and person of the Father. The desire of God to really be our Father, that we would look like our dad, that we would act like our dad, that we would learn the lessons uh, from our heavenly dad, right? And verse 11, believe me that I am the Father and the Father is in me, otherwise believe because of the works themselves. So again, He's saying, even though this may confuse you, do you get it? Everything I've done that you've seen, everything I've done for you, it speaks a message of the Father's love and of his instruction to you. But Lord, we're confused. How can you be three and yet one? How can we have it? We're confused. It's like, okay, okay. But do you get this? When I fed you, when I healed when I'm going to rise from the dead. Will you get that? It's the Father's favor, grace, love, outpouring, rescue of you and I, right? Okay. So in, in Romans 8, 29, it says there in the middle part, he predestined us to become conformed to the image of his son. So I wanted to throw that so you, you would you just see that. It is the Holy Spirit's work our whole life long is to keep molding us, shaping us to be like Jesus Get in this place of essence and person and likeness, right? Okay. And this place of how Jesus, what did he model? He was always in the Father, and the Father was always in him. And what he did, he did because the Father was doing what he spoke, what his heart, how he felt, how he discerned, judged, evaluated. And this one crazy verse in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. It's like, wow, who on earth could possibly say that statement? And here's Paul saying it. The Lord had grown him and transformed him so much into the likeness of Jesus. You guys want to know how to do it? Hey, follow my example as I try to follow Christ. There was no hypocrisy. There was no, hey, dude, do, do this. Don't, don't do like I'm doing. I'm, I'm screwing up, you know. I mean, that's amazing to me that, that, that Paul could say that truthfully. That imitate me as I imitate Christ. So this is where it all kind of comes together, you know, for, you know, dads, you know, fathers. I just want to share some stories. Uh, this shaping for me, and, and, and not just for me, I, again, I, I, I tell these stories, I, I like telling them, but I also f hate that it feels like I point this as much attention to stuff for me. But, but the lessons that are there, you know, uh, when my kids were born, all three of them, but Chris first, I mean, we're laughing because we're so overjoyed. And 
I cannot believe I'm a dad. We had lost a baby through miscarriage, and I honestly was afraid that we would never be able to have kids. And there's Chris, healthy big boy, comes out pooping, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, he's, he's all right. And, uh, and I just left the hospital. I'm a dad. I can't believe I'm a dad. And I could not believe the joy that filled my heart. It's like, I get to be a dad. And I remember sometime during that first year, you know, I, I was holding him, and I'm just amazed and in wonder. And, you know, especially when you get your first baby, you can't stop staring. Why is everything so tiny? Look at those tiny lashes. Those tiny it, you know, we, we stopped watching TV altogether because <laughs> we were just watching our baby uh, burp and fart and gurgle. Look, he's talking. And of course, he's a day old, right? He said, Mom. Like, he said, Dad. And so sometime in the midst of, of, of caring him, you know, and I'm, I'm just loving and worshiping the Lord. It's like, Lord, I can't believe I'm a dad. I love this little guy so much. And I had this realization. I can't believe that I'm so in love with the person I just met. I, I, I'm ready to change my entire life to make sure he's okay and that he's protected, safe, you know. And, and, and I hear the Lord in the, in the midst of me talking to him about how amazed I am and, and how thankful I am for becoming a father for my, my little guy. I hear the Lord say, can this little boy do anything that will make you stop loving him? And I'm like, no, there's no way. I'm stunned that I love him so much already, so quickly, and he hasn't done anything. And the next thing I know, the Lord is flashing scenes through my mind. Uh, Chris getting older, uh, disobeying the Lord, being rebellious, and, uh, becoming a teenager, not even liking Barb and I, doing things totally contrary to what our heart is or what we would teach him to do. And I'm, my heart is sinking as these scenes are flashing through my eyes, my spiritual eyes, and I'm thinking, oh no. Are you telling me this is what's going to happen with, with my son? And so I'm feeling that distress and my heart's sinking. And I ask the Lord, I hear the Lord say again, can this little boy do anything that will make you stop loving him? And I, st I start crying. I can't turn it off now. I can't stop loving him. But God, he could break my heart. He could break my heart so bad. And I'm weeping. And I'm waiting for him to tell me, then raise him up in the way that he should go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it, you know. And I'm ready to do it. Just tell me what to do so this doesn't happen. And I hear the Lord say, son, this is how I love you. And then he was gone. And I'm just weeping. How? How? How could you love me like that? And I'm thinking, well, of course, he's God. I can't be a better father than God, could I, you know? And if I could love my son this way, having just met him, why have I struggled to receive the Father's love and forgiveness all the years of my Christian life up to then? And that was just the beginning of this, this healing that God did, but came because he made me a father, and my heart was open. And my heart was open to see now what he'd been trying to work on me for years. You know, you guys have heard that spiritual warfare story where I'm... Uh, I'm discovering the armor of God, and I'm asking the Lord, show me where I've been deceived. And the first thing he tells me, you, you're yelling at your wife too much. Goes, no, I'm not. And he goes, the kids are little. you got to run a tight ship. You know, she's got to take care of her end. I can take care of her end. So I'm not yelling at her, Lord. I encourage her loudly sometimes, you know. And, uh, and then so I dismiss it. And I don't think it was the Lord. So I go back to praying. So, Lord, I'm trying to figure out this armor of God stuff. And okay, show me where I've been deceived, and whatever you show me, I'll make right. And I hear him say, you asked me something, I told you, and you told me it's not so. Really? Am I really yelling at my wife too much? Okay. And I hear, she's a gift from me to you. Okay, that sounds biblical. You know? So I go over and Barb's asleep, and I give her a big kiss. I go, honey, I'm sorry, I'm a jerk. I can be a real jerk sometimes. And she barely wakes up enough to smile at me and give her little giggle. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm like, I'm like, that counts. It's apology. That counts, you know. And then I said, okay, Lord, maybe that was you, maybe it's not, but it's still a good thing, you know. I, I'll, I'll try to be more careful. And then I'm like, okay, anything else you want to tell me? Any place else? Anything else that I'm doing that any other lies I believe? And, and he says, you're yelling at your kids too much too. I go, no, I'm not. And he goes, the Bible says raise up your kids in the way they should go, and they're, well, they won't depart from it. It's chaos from the second they wake up to the second they go to sleep. They tear the house apart section by section, and then we have to pull it, put it back together again. And there's not one thing that I can put down that I don't find somewhere else, sometime much later, in a different part of the house. 
And then so I said, I don't think that was the Lord, because I'm not really doing that. So I go back to praying. Lord, show me where I've been deceived, and whatever you show me, I'll make right. And he says, you did it again. And I'm shocked. It's like, I did? And this realization comes, do I always do that? Have you been trying to tell me things, convict my heart? And I keep telling you it's not so. And then I hear him say, your kids are not yours. One day you're giving them back to me. Four in thought, totally not anywhere in my awareness. And I look back now and I can say, that was definitely Lord, because that was nowhere in my thinking. And then it was afterwards when I pondered that, that's biblical. Nothing is mine. Not my wife, not my kids, not my finances, not my health, not my life, not my time. It's all given by God as a gift, but for me also to steward, right? And that changed me because I kept thinking, if my time with him is short, oh my gosh, it's like, there's only a certain amount of time before, you know, Chris at the time was five. It's like, I stopped talking to mom and dad when I was 10 because we kept clashing and I just couldn't trust them to understand anything I was saying anymore. We always were starting to fight. So I just stopped talking to them. I go, oh my gosh, I, don't, I have five years or less before my kids stop talking to me. And then if I keep on the same route, it's going to be how, like me and mom turned, me, 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 mom and dad turned out where there's so much distance and misunderstanding between us. And it immediately changed me. I became more patient. I started embracing the chaos. I started embracing the fact that my house was being torn apart section by section every morning. I began to embrace that all my money is being spent <laughs> all the time for, for kids and family stuff, right? right? And somewhere in the midst of that, you know, this focus in the family, he's talking, you know, probably during Father's Day, and he goes, Dads, the Lord wants you to love your children the way he would if he were there. Because one day he's going to introduce himself to your kids. And if you're like Jesus, if you're like the Heavenly Father, they'll recognize him. And the handoff from you and your wife to your children will be easy. And I'm like, oh, gosh, Lord, that makes so much sense. That makes so much sense. Uh, again, another thing the Lord sent my way, it's like, I, I'm changing you. I want you to be like me. I want you to be like me because your family, your wife, the people you know need me. And then you get an encounter with me. And I want to do that through you if you're enough like me. Then they'll hear what you say, but they'll receive it as Jesus saying it, as the Father saying it. That you'll love and do something the way the Father would do in his love and kindness and generosity and they would see it as, wow, the Lord loves me. The Lord, believe the works. If you don't believe what everybody else is saying about it, believe the works. And that becomes one of the things the Lord would do to, to, to witness, to share, to introduce himself. One time, you know, Chris and Tim were uh, upset. And they were, you know, you did this, you did that, you said this. And they were, you know, and so Barb, uh, I wasn't, th I was somewhere else, and Barb caught them fighting with each other and being mean to each other and stuff. Okay, what's going on? Because, oh, you did this. And you said that. And they're going back and forth. And then Barb said, it just came into her mind. She said, now, wait, stop, boys. Is this something your father would do to you? And they both so, you know, kind of settled down real quick. They said, no, dad never calls us names. Dad always encourages us. He never does this. Never. And it was like, and then they both started to cry. And then quickly they were forgiving each other. And then Barb's, you know, uh, coming and telling me, that, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm thank and I'm stunned. It's like, oh my gosh, Lord, they're seeing you. I've, I've been trying so hard to be different, to not do things the way my parents did, to not be the, you know, because honestly, until that moment when God spoke to me about my kids not belonging to me, you know, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, all my time is being taken up, all my money is being spent, when's, when's there going to be time for me? What about all these self-improvement things? And there's one time, Barb, you asked me, Pete, do you resent me? Do you resent our family because of what it takes away from you? And by then I was coming around and I said, no, honey, I, I don't. I'm just trying to figure this out because I have. I've been so self-focused, right, uh, and trying to change that. And so at a certain point when I finally, you know, got ordained and they were ordaining me as a pastor, I didn't have a suit. And I, I, grown, I, I grew the one I graduated high school in. 
And so these guys uh, picked me up for lunch, and we went out. And instead of going to lunch, they took me to a, to a, um, a suit shop. He goes, pick one. He goes, what? He goes, we're buying you a suit. He goes, no, 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 you guys, I, I, I'll just wear a tie. He goes, no, no, we're buying you a suit to get ordained in. Okay, so I picked the cheapest suit I could find, you know, and then they took me to lunch. And then later on, they told me, they, we collected a bunch of money for you to, to get a suit, but we, we knew that if we gave it to you, you would just give the money to Barb for you, her and the kids. I go, yeah, pretty much. You know, was, so we just had to take you and make you get one, and we'd pay for it. And, you know, I thought, yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. And I went back to the Lord that day. I said, Lord, how did you do that? I'm as selfish as they come. There's a time they would have given me the money and I easily bought the suit or whatever. But now it was like, no, my wife needs the money. My kids need it. Yeah, take it. You know, this is like, Lord, how did you do that? And he said, I gave you somebody to love besides yourself and offered you that chance, will you love them more than yourself? I was like, wow. And, you know, and am I talking to the Lord? It's like, you, you couldn't have beaten that selfishness out of me. You couldn't have. You know, I might have got a little bit better, but you have never have gotten it out of me. But you did it by offering me somebody to love and then wanting to love them more than I love myself. And at this point that I'm, I'm having this conversation with the Lord, I'm, I'm seeing the change that he's made in me, and I'm thinking, You've made my life noble. There are things that I do that actually have no agenda except to love. I don't need it. I said, I can't believe you did that. But also the way you do it, you do it through love. Not only loving me, but offering you and I people to love, right? And so fathers, when we're talking about today honoring our fathers, I'm thinking back to my dad, my mom, the people in my life, and the places where they did show Jesus, they did show the Father's heart, uh, and however that was able to get through. Uh, and the gratefulness that I have in, in you, my friends, the times when I see Jesus coming out of you, and I, I see now, wow, this is what the Lord is doing. This is what he wanted when he f started saving us, is one not only to save us, but that we would grow in that place of, the Father and Son would abide in us, and we would abide in, in them. And that oneness would change us to genuinely where things come out of us that are so the Lord and not us anymore, not the flesh. And, and honoring our fathers and honoring the people around us is, Lord, I esteem and bless and honor how my dad, my dad was patient. I, I, I've never had the trouble understanding the patience of God because my dad was patient. And we pushed him. We pushed him really, really a lot, you know. And my dad would, he, he, he's, he's never, I don't remember him hitting us, ever. Uh, he would give us light spanks, you know, symbolic spanks, you know. Uh, and, but he would lecture us. And that was, that was worse than spanking, you know. Spanking would be over, just hit me and get it over with him. But, but the, the lecturing was like, yeah, now I feel really bad. <laughs> uh, but there was so much, so much there. Um, and I look back now, and I can see how much he tried to give, but he was very, very handicapped because of how deep his, his wounds were and deep uh, stuff that went on in his life. But to see what my dad overcame that way, you know? Uh, so the thing that I, I just really want us to, to, to grab and looking at this is like, you know, Father, thank you for the good works that came from the people you gave us, our fathers, our mothers, our family members, our friends. And those are the works that testify that, Jesus, you're in it. You're in it for us, and you're in it for who you want us to be, whether it's your family or the people, everybody the Lord sends your way. He is so wanting through what you say and what you do for it to be him doing that because he loves. He loves you. He loves the people who come your way. The, the things, the God things that you will see around you when you start to grab this. Because he said, do you not see that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? If you know this, greater works than these will you do. 
because it's always been God doing it. But crazy enough, he wants to do it through you in your oneness together. Because it's you and Jesus, you and Father God. And, you know, you're, you're wanting to know, Lord, what do you think about this? What do you want me to pass on? What encouragement, what word, what do you want me to do? That releases, you know, the heart of God, the presence of God, the encounters of God. Father, just bless you. Bless all that you still have to do because until, you know, uh, until it's time to go home, you know, you don't ever stop loving your kids. You stop worrying about them, right? You know? Uh, and of the, it may change, but there's always, there'll always be things that the Lord has for you to share and minister and love your family with. So let's stand, let's pray. Father, we bless you. We love you, Lord. And we ask that our eyes would be clear to see you and to see you even more clearly in your hand. You have loved us so well and so thoroughly. And you've not stopped. And you've not stopped pursuing us, contending for us, warring for us, coming to protect us, to deliver us, to heal us. That your heart toward us is so favorable that you and Jesus uh, and the Holy Spirit, your pursuit of us and your desire is not just to do these things for their own sake, but because you are forming in us your likeness. And you want to do that in us, with us, together with us, that we would also be like Jesus was, that clearly bringing you, showing the love of the Father, doing your works, speaking your words, releasing, declaring, teaching only what you're declaring, teaching. We invite you to come in all your fullness. Come Holy Spirit to minister. Father, I ask your Father's heart would be released today. There are so many, Lord, that, that need to be healed by your love. Lord, remove every wound of condemnation, judgment, of harshness, every father wound, every mother wound. Uh, Lord, every pastor, spiritual leader wound. Lord, we forgive those who have hurt us, betrayed us, offended us who did not walk in you like they were supposed to. And we ask you to forgive them when we forgive them. But we ask now, Lord, that there would be a healing and an openness to you like we've never experienced. Release your love over your people right now. Father, we are going to ask those who need healing, release your healing to them. More healing, another measure of healing, full healing. Lord, we give you permission, Holy Spirit, to move as freely as you desire over everyone here. Lord, we ask for a, a new mercy and grace to heal wounded hearts, wounded souls. Lord, we ask for an openness to hear your voice afresh, even more clearly. Father, we reawaken the dreamers, Lord God, to dream uh, and to dream dreams from you, Lord God. Uh, open this, the, those who hear to hear even more clearly, Lord. Release again your anointing to bring souls into the kingdom to release healing, to release signs and wonders, Lord, to set and stabilize the foundations so that they can't be shaken. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Worship team is going to be leading us. I'll be up here with some others. If you need prayer, please you know, just grab one of us.
do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to I will make room for you to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to surrender this is my surrender here is where I lay it down every lie and every doubt this is my surrender and I will make room for you to do whatever you do whatever you want to I will make room for you to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to shake up the ground of all my tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better Your way is better Shake up the ground Of all my tradition Break down the walls Of all my religion Your way is better Your way is better And I will make room For you Do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to Do whatever you want to I will make room for you To do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to Ah uh... 